Welcome back to the DCS Zip Rep. This is episode number 35. This past week, ED dropped one of the biggest patches into DCS World, introducing a large number of fixes and a massive update to Syria. So let's get started. Hello again, and I'm your host, Prickly Hedgehog, talking news and information about DCS World, which is the premier combat flight simulator for the home PC. As you heard this week, there was a huge patch from Ego Dynamics with a lot of new material, including third-party developer Uber Media's Syria map, which received some pretty fantastic updates. Also, they did some work similarly on their Normandy 2 map. Now, before we go into maps, let's take a look at some of the other features sprinkled through rather liberally the core engine and other game assets all for our benefit. We'll start with DCS Core. Now, according to the synopsis from Ego Dynamics, they describe that in the latest update, weapon systems received valuable optimizations, including the AIM-120 guidance system. Further enhancements focus on a long list of AI improvements, which we'll come to in a sec, air defense unit effectiveness, as well as various needed bug fixes. We sincerely extend our gratitude, they say, to the closed beta test members and the community for their valuable contributions. Other improvements include an Ali Burke class weapon selection panel and a general air defense unit update that avoids unrealistic identification and engagement without clear line of sight to target. So one thing I did note, when we mentioned here with AI, there was a major injection of fixes to AI assets and components in the game. Mentioning we start really uh, with the AI SAM that we rounded out the opening there with, which tracks targets without line of sight. This has been fixed. Uh, and in some cases, it would do that. Now, this will improve air defense units engaging aircraft behind cover, which is good news. Now, moving on to some other things here. They've fixed things like the AI EWR, which is not responding on the client side in multiplayer. AI wingman collisions during landing on the ship in some cases. So that's really good news. AI aircraft horizontal triple A evade. This has been fixed. Advanced waypoint reaction to threat action wasn't working. They've also fixed here AI aircraft sometimes ignore bombing waypoint actions. Frustrating. They've fixed AI wingmen starting taxiing before the leading player moves. Again, frustrating, but um, fixed. Good news. AI delay in initial ground units column start moving. Fixed AI vehicles that will not go to the first waypoint when go to waypoint is used. They've fixed AI ground unit deviation from the route if the route is looped. AI wingman collision when executing a command to go pincer right. Annoying. <laughs> and that's been corrected. The AI F4E is able to independently guide multiple AGM-12 simultaneously, which it shouldn't be able to do. That's been corrected along with the F4E, which will not engage with AGM-65 in some cases. Again, a correction there. Some AI improvements include aircraft AI attack logic with anti-radiation missiles has been changed to use the appropriate number of missiles per target, depending on missile generation. And then wrapping up here, AI improvement for AI added loft attack maneuvers. Example in case is the F4E lofting strike missiles. So a lot of really good updates there. Obviously, work on AI is always going to be ongoing, and there are some quirks with it, as we know. Sadly, some of them are pretty glaring at times, which can be a little frustrating, or at least immersion destroying from time to time. Most of the time, it does a pretty good job of providing that immersion uh, feeling. But yes, certainly it's nice to see some of these fixes, and hopefully this um, continues in a way that, again, makes it uh, not an immersion breakup. A couple of highlights within the long list of items. One for me, very exciting, New Zealand country has been added. Yes, so the homeland is finally being represented, Carpi ED. Uh, also, AIM-7 logic has been tweaked in the way it responds to chaff. There's been optimization of the cluster munition 
effects. So fixed stock effects in some cases an added level of details technique for clustered emitters. So some good news there. VR users, uh, the team has updated the spotting dot size in VR adjusted to be smaller in certain cases based on feedback. That's good news. They're still working on different preset logic for VR. Be advised though that setting improved spotting dots does not affect the presence of spotting dots in VR. So please read the setting tooltip for more information. Good news. Uh, I think there was something that Heapler recommend or was recommended to remove with regards to VR settings as well. There was questions about that in the forums. Uh, people wanted to know what was removed. So, you know, VR is still a, an emerging technology in many respects. And while it's getting very, very good, it still needs some work in DCS yet. Uh, but nonetheless, and we'll come back to this topic in a minute, if you are going to get into VR, definitely I recommend Pimax. And once you do go VR, it's very hard to go back, I must say. Well, let's talk about aircraft because most of the in-house aircraft for DCS got updates. So we're talking here the the Viper now features independent MFD brightness controls, uh, saved master modes for missile overrides. They're fixed uh, or have fixes for the TMS FCR functionality and CCIP steering. Automatic steer point sequencing now functions correctly and the 152nd livery typo has been corrected. Several radar improvements are also included and work progresses on that sniper pod as well as the flight model and uh, flight control system tuning. So good news there. Similarly for the F-18, again, an excellent aircraft. This receives the ability to dual rack carriage of GBU-32s and various fixes for radar and navigation functions. Radar tuning and multi-sensor integration or MSI enhancements are ongoing, aiming to elevate its combat performance and versatility. It still is a very uh, capable aircraft and certainly very, very versatile. The Apache, uh, similarly a versatile helicopter, has uh, received the air targeting mode of the fire control radar, which was introduced. Uh, remember, there was, uh, was a couple of videos from WAGS recently on this. Along with the updates to uh, that, there was also updates to mission and fuel functionality. Avionics and targeting bugs continue to be tuned, and they are still fine-tuning and improving the stability and your control. Great helicopter, yet another aircraft I haven't had enough time by any stretch of the imagination it's uh it's been a very very popular aircraft and a lot of fun to fly speaking of a lot of fun to fly dcs's latest helicopter the ch-47 f chinook this has received a large number of updates recently as is expected these include automatic turn coordination longitudinal cyclic trim or lct and initial differential airspeed hold or dash so these are all greatly enhanced stability and control which is really good news uh it also represents significant improvements to radios uh well, excuse me let me rephrase that the aircraft also saw significant improvements to radios and cockpit functionalities along with the a FCS tuning which is underway. Now in a little bit more detail from the changelog they said that the LCT functionality in automatic and manual modes has been added. The LCT reduces fuselage nose down attitude as speed increases by tilting the rotors according to airspeed between 60 and 150 knots. Now this allows the fuselage to remain level for both cargo and people troops which obviously would make the ride a lot more comfortable especially if you're in the very very back or the way, way back. Uh, they've also added differential airspeed hold, as described before, the dash functionality. It's a work in progress, but as you increase speed, the dash, which is a long tube in the flight controls with an actuator on each end, apparently, will increase in length. Now, if you move the cyclic back to center, the aircraft will still maintain its airspeed. This allows you to keep the cyclic in a more natural center position when flying at higher airspeeds, rather than having to kind of push the nose down and the cyclic down. Um, you don't have to do that which makes, as described, it a lot more comfortable. They've also added the two radios, the ARC 201D and 220. This is still work in progress. Now, the work on the AFCS was something that 
YouTuber CH47 driver had requested ED focus on to improve the flight characteristics and ease of handling, which therefore increase, increases the usability of the aircraft in game. And that's going to enhance our player experience and enjoyment overall. Looking forward to doing some troop dropping or insertion in Afghanistan here. Uh, hopefully, as time goes on, we'll see some campaigns for this pretty interesting helicopter. It's actually quite a lot of fun to fly. Uh, yet another one that I haven't had enough time to fly and get to grips with. Landing is um, not my thing in this one, so I definitely need a lot more practice to uh, to get to grips with it. And I'm curious to see if any of these changes have made any improvements there. So stay tuned. Visual. That's copy. Take off six four. Currently down to uh, one Copy all. Now, Asset Packs and other aircraft modules, they talked here about the new animations for World War II soldiers, damage model fixes and aircraft adjustments across World War II modules, enhance the immersion and realism. Notable updates include fixed brakes and visuals on aircraft such as the FW-190 and the BF-109. And they've actually improved the Yak-52 lighting for night flights. For those of you uh, who enjoy flying that little aircraft, it's a fun little piece of equipment. That's one I picked up actually just for giggles during one of the sales. So not everyone's cup of tea, of course, but nonetheless, uh, fun to see uh, this little aircraft in game. And yeah, it has some, some benefit for those uh, who enjoy that kind of thing. Now I'm eager to see updated animations and things for the modern soldiers, which we need for the troop insertion, if you like, for the Chinook and obviously the C-130 as well. We saw this showcased a little bit in some videos during the year, particularly the 2024 and beyond video. Uh, this is definitely something needed, like I said, so stay tuned for that. Remember that the C-130 is a third party module from aircraft simulations we're still waiting for some updates on that a couple of photos were published recently on their discord which is difficult to take too much from but it's nice to see some updates if you like or something being produced by the company showcasing the work that they're doing and they have given us a few little snippets a couple of little animations of interior stuff so i'm hopeful we'll we'll see some more information on this aircraft as time wears on but not too much time hopefully all right let's get to i guess in some ways a controversial topic the dc is super carrier based on some uh, youtube videos and comments lately uh this has received a couple of fixes with regards to the air boss and the logic for the aoa repeater lights with new deck crew animations approaching launch now additional information from the changelog about that they're saying here that programming of the new deck crew logic and animations is complete. Huzzah! And undergoing final tests. Huzzah again. Now, while not quite ready for this update, boo, it is around the corner. Yay! Oh gosh, I hope that corner is not too wide. Now, if uh, it's definitely something that's long overdue and oft requested, although, as I said, some commentators have been slamming ED about the ATC functionality around the boat and AI. Uh, and then for that matter, airfields as well. So it is pretty scripted. And if you deviate from that process or make a hash of it in the in the process, uh, the ATC system doesn't really offer you a whole lot of redress in a, I guess, perhaps realistic fashion. Uh, the complaint was essentially that there's really, like I said, no flexibility and the AI aircraft also trigger errors and become problematic too from time to time. I suspect and no disrespect to anyone criticizing the supercarrier module, but I suspect that it's extremely challenging, to say the least, to build an ATC system that can accommodate the kinds of intense aircraft operations associated with cyclic ops on aircraft carriers, especially at night as well. There's a myriad of moving parts that I don't think we can truly hope to achieve in recreating in terms of intensity and dynamic, uh, if I can say that right, dynamicism dynamicism tricky one that one so i'm willing to suspend some of my expectations in this area uh obviously i'm not abandoning you know that ed doesn't do anything with it you know we've, we've been talking about this for quite a while now and uh, there's been a long list of delays with regards to improvements to the super carrier uh, juice from the air warfare group actually brought up a little video recently that it would be neat if ed could introduce an electronic ouija board for the supercarrier, which in real life is used to represent the planning and movement of aircraft uh, moving around the deck, 
being parked, so on and so forth during cyclic ops. Now, for those of you that might be confused, the wizard board is a metaphor. So we're not actually trying to conjure up deceased aircraft or their crews. Uh, Halloween is past us already, unfortunately. Now, in the comment section, someone actually pointed out, this is on Juice's video, and I think he was a, I'm assuming it was a he here, of course, I'm being gender biased there, but they pointed out that the introduction of electronic Ouija boards couldn't actually keep up with the amount of movement that was going on. So uh, obviously there's been adjustments since, since that time, but traditionally they were actually sort of crewed by people as these assets on the deck were moved around. It gave a sort of eye of God on the whole platform to make sure you know everything was where it was supposed to be, which is critical in a space contingent environment. Uh, it gets dangerous. There's a lot of uh, assets on that deck that need to be squared away, launched and recovered. So it's a, as I said, it's a very dynamic environment. It definitely that, I think that would be a neat addition in conjunction with, you know, more flexibility with the air boss uh, in multiplayer, which I think uh, was lacking in the game. And again, I think having the airboss station up there, being able to do some multiplayer work in that area, or even having a little bit more flexibility than the ATC for solo players would be really beneficial. As I said, I'm not saying that ED should rest on its laurels with regards to that. Uh, and some people will say they have no laurels to rest on, but you know, I disagree. I think it's an incredibly complex module that they've created there and again I, I think it's very difficult to update this in a way that perhaps some expectation can provide things i'd like to see definitely are updated animations which they're obviously working for the uh, on for their deck crew the plane captain's handoff type stuff as well with with assets being moved around the deck uh, I'd like to see better AI aircraft operation. Obviously, that's a huge component of this. Uh, they talked, and well, Wags mentioned that you can't have people being run over by the aircraft, that kind of thing. So that was something that they were struggling, I think, to implement or just takes more time to implement. One thing I'd also like to see is an improved wake representation from the boat, especially if there's a lack of wind. Therefore, the boat really has to move, so you're going to get a bigger wake. Uh, and as I said, definitely more work on that ATC and ATC in game in general, which I think is also tied into most likely the dynamic campaign i think that atc is going to it's going to need more voice actors this has been discussed in the past it's going to need more fine tuning to be able to cope with a lot more assets being um being worked reflected simulations also brought up the fact that some of the airfields in normandy 2 are too small to handle large formations of aircraft and he would like a little bit more fleshing out of that stuff. So that's something that maybe um, Ugra Media needs to reach out to him about too in terms of campaign creation because obviously he's got a lot of experience in using those assets to create some pretty cool campaigns for World War II uh, theatres. So again, there's a lot of discussion around this. I'm hopeful though too for improvements that are definitely going to enhance it because things like crossover functionality for ground crew for land-based airfields too, again, is going to provide a boost in realism. So I think anything that they can do to, I guess, in defense of the of the supercarry module is is going to be beneficial. And a reminder too, there's no other video game video game that I know right now that has come close to providing the level of realism ED has done for carrier-based flight operations than with the supercarrier. So although it has a lot of issues and it does get criticized, it's still a pretty amazing feat that what they've actually been able to provide within the restrictions of, of video gaming and the AI logic that I think that they have, which obviously needs an overhaul. But you know, I'm getting really picky. I could be, I don't want to be one of those people that just slams the entire module because they haven't produced the ready room. You know, I know that's been talked about for a long time or the ability to go into the hangars and stuff like that, the working elevators. Obviously, those are aesthetic things are an, which are an important part of it, but it's not a deal breaker for me in terms of enjoying the module and what it delivers in terms of immersion. So I'm hoping to see what these assets do these new animations and whether that brings things up just a, a little bit more if we get these other things as well like the wake like the the working elevators the ready room and so on and so forth that will all just be icing on the cake but uh, in fairness it's been a long time coming and uh, i can understand why some people are a little frustrated and feel like it's a low priority perhaps but well, we'll have to wait and see what they come up with magic laser 41 with you checking in copy all established holding copy that most of the other aircraft modules got updates in this latest patch, including, of course, ones that aren't made by Eagle Dynamics. We're talking everything from India Fox to Echo, Heat Blur, and Argus, among others. So do check out the changelog for more specific information for your favorite DCS model 
and I'll post a link in the description below for you. Well, let's turn now to maps and terrains. And for my mind, these just keep getting better and better in DCS. And it is disappointing, unfortunately, that the topic of maps last week sparked quite a massive backlash about the way in which Afghanistan and Iraq have been both released and implemented or are being implemented. I think there's a broadening level of negativity and cynicism in some quarters of the DCS community. There's reasons for that, which we won't go into in this video. That probably needs to be a separate topic. But I'm a little bit concerned. You know, I'm a glass half full guy when it comes to DCS in general, despite its faults, quirks, and occasional irritations. But I'm pretty concerned about some of the negativity that has become a little consuming, I think, for some people. Now, Let's switch to the massive positivity here, and that is the implementation of a number of updates to Syria from Ugra Media, which generally seems to have been well received. Don't forget, too, they also did some work on their Normandy 2 map, something that we also discussed last week in a little bit more detail. So without going through last week's list play-by-play -play again, remember this included things like model updates, map optimizations, uh, destruction models, and uh, uh, implementation for some of the assets and new airfields like Ben Gurion. Similarly, the Normandy map also received treatment with some new airfields. Now, as I said, based on reports from the community and some other content creators, it appears that these maps, particularly Syria, have been very well received. That's positive. I'll refer you to last week's video and or the change log if you're curious about specifics to what they did update in Syria. But I think overall, it's looking really good and I'm overall again excited about the general direction of maps because they're looking pretty cool right now and obviously there's going to be some interesting competition for microsoft flight simulator 2024 whether it stacks up how it stacks up against dcs maps it's going to be interesting to make the comparison now as i said other maps also got updates including one of my favorites south atlantic by rasbam i've always enjoyed this map as many of you know this has received things like custom helipads around main cities and in popular areas. And apparently there are a lot more to come, so that's good news. They've added extra low detail grass for improved low level visuals, so that's exciting. They've fixed normals not showing correctly in treed areas, areas from last update they said occurred there, optimizations across road networks. They've corrected flare on some traffic vehicles. They've corrected texture mismatch on different roads, merging junctions, various model Z fighting fixed removed model errors for logs or from logs and southwest side fields on or at Punta Arenas have also been adjusted. Now one thing that was interesting here too they've also done uh, John, they've also done some South Atlantic asset um, pack updates so they've added the L118 unit field artillery gun default green and desert livery which are now available. They've added Atlantic conveyor there's a known issue with the AI spawns unfortunately. Uh, hopefully that'll be corrected, uh, corrected next patch. San Carlos fortification has also been added. That's neat. And they've updated all the frigates. Now have a re uh, reduced or decreased turn radius. And the frigates also roll in the turn, which is nice. Frigates now use ship smoke particle system, which is good. They've fixed the CCAT returns to home position to reload all missiles simultaneously. Reload period is set to five minutes. Frigates increase distance of finding obstacles. And the Lark 5 naming on F10 map here, Castle Class Main Gun Sound, Castle Class Sam RWR, and Santa, uh, Santa Fe LOD 1 set to 20 kilometers. So some good changes there. We, I haven't seen much in terms of assets there in the past, so it's good to see some adjustments there, especially in terms of the frigates and a little bit more realism. So good stuff going on with that map. Another great map to Cola, which is by Orbex. This has this has been a good map, I think, and I'm surprised that some people don't like it. I think I'm very much looking forward to Baltic and um, Reflected's Arctic Thunder campaign on this map as well. So we'll see how that gets implemented, hopefully here before the end of the year. That'll give it a little bit more of a connection to using it in anger, if you like. But uh, regardless, they've added a few new airfields, Andoya Airfield, a la Corti, a la Corti, I don't know, I suck at pronunciation there, I should have looked this up ahead of time, it's a tricky one that one. Uh, they've added new towns and villages around each airfield, which is cool, so a little bit more fleshing out of the environment there, in terms of the human environment, added some missing rivers and lakes, so 
there's the physical environment getting some updates and they've added more uh, islands or added the missing islands at least east of Kallax airfield. So again, some more adjustments to the physical environment. Uh, they've cleaned up and fixed the vector data. This is around the airfields. Uh, Kimi Tornio, they have updated AI there to prevent planes blocking passages by moving towards each other. Okay, good. And they've smoothed the forest borders and artifact cleanup under the bridge at Severa Morsk, which is good news. Again, a great map, a lot of fun to fly around and enjoy that map. Enjoy the work that they've done, uh, Orbex, on that particular map. Of course, these maps always remind me of home a little bit with the mountains and the greenery and so on and so forth is probably why I find them a little bit more um, appealing than perhaps some other people do, but that's just me. All right, moving on to Edie's blurb about the Afghanistan map, where work continues on both the Afghanistan southwest region and the entire Afghanistan map. The ground mesh resolution across Afghanistan has been improved along with optimization and bug fixes across the southwest. The road network has been enhanced, especially the mountain roads. Cool. Additionally, they've improved the ground geometry artifacts which have been corrected so some cool stuff there object model inaccuracies have been fixed and unique airfield objects have been added to diversify the scenery they have also uh, announced here that they're pleased to advise that the normal map textures across the entire afghanistan map have been refined for improved low altitude visuals this will keep people happy or will hopefully belay some of the complaints that we had recently now the team is mainly focused on finalizing the east region of the afghanistan map work on the airfields of Bagram, Bamiyan, Gardiz, and Ghazni, Jalalabad, Kabul, Kost, and Sharana, and Ergun is going well, and the final stages of creating unique scenes for these airfields and their operational logic within the DCS core is underway. So they say here they've achieved significant progress on new roads, rivers, lakes, as well as unique object models for the capital city of Kabul. So looking forward to seeing that. And they say they're looking forward to our feedback on that when it gets introduced. Now, in spite of frustration raised about both Afghanistan and Iraq, and also in spite of clarification by ED on the fact that different teams are working on them so that work on one doesn't affect or hinder the development of the other, I like this map. Um, I'm very much looking forward to seeing Kabul and the implementation of the refinements they mentioned. And also I'm curious about what that operational logic they mentioned here means in game for us. So we've talked about ATC before refinement needing to occur for the supercarrier and also for the airfields around. So again, I'm aware from many interviews ago with ED that there needed to be an overhaul for ATC for the dynamic campaign, as we've already talked about. So again, for that to work seamlessly, there has to be some adjustments. And again, I'm intrigued what that statement means. So stay tuned future videos here for more information about that and also more release information on Iraq. Now, lastly, here from this week's newsletter, ED plugged another campaign. This is Dragon's Fury by Sorrel Row. And this is a 15 mission campaign. You will fly the F-16 Viper as part of the 23rd Fighter Squadron at Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. It's a free map, by the way. Uh, you will take part in escalating conflict between U.S. forces and Chinese PLN and PLA forces that are attacking the Marianas Islands under the pretext of helping the Chamorro Nation gain independence. And it's a good example, again, here of using existing maps and strategic locations to create fictional but pretty plausible campaigns with the existing assets in game. And I appreciate this uh, more than probably a lot of people realize. I think it's really cool. So the campaign is designed around large strike packages. Again, that's really cool. And you'll fly alongside F-16Cs, F-15Cs, F-15Es, F-A-18Cs, a B-52H or three, and E-3As and KC-135s so while well trying to repel Chinese forces. So it uh, sounds like an interesting campaign. Key features include 15 story-driven uh, story missions, over 4,000 voiceovers, a large variety of missions, including CAP, Seed, Deed, CAS, and Precision Strikes. Detailed briefings, kneeboard files, and supporting documentation for each mission, which is becoming really the new norm for a lot of our campaigns. A lot more realism, a lot more detail, and a lot of fun, and some really interesting challenges. So they hope that you enjoy F-16C Dragon's Fury, and the other new campaign, the Apache, the Outpost campaign. So good stuff. Now that wraps up ED-specific news, but I hope to be bringing you more information on aircraft updates 
to the Sky Raider by Crosstail Studios here soon. One of uh, third-party developers, remember, India Fox Echo gave us a little teaser of their DCS G91 and went on to explain that one of the reasons they're quieter about their DCS development processes is because it's extremely complex compared to Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, and therefore it takes a lot longer. The team work closely, remember, with Heat Blur, which is a good idea, and third-party developers are apparently welcome to work with Heat Blur. Remember, this is something that came up from the head honcho over at Heat Blur, Nick Deckard. Uh, he made this comment a few years ago when explaining the partnership that they had created with True Grit to get the Eurofighter out, which True Grit was recognizing was going to be a bigger project than perhaps they first uh, thought uh, and teamed up with Heat Blur to make that happen. So hopefully we're going to hear some news about that aircraft in 2025. Fingers crossed. Now, Heat Blur did make a forum announcement about the Tom Caps, uh, Tom Caps, Tom Cats, Tarps Pod, too many P's in there, avail uh, availability and new weapons such as the CBU-99 and also added support for launching Chaff from the expanded Chaff adapter, which uses the pilot bomb release button and air to ground mode with interval timer. So very cool. The Tomcat remains one of my go-to modules when I just want to kick the tires and light the sim fires. Now, on that basis, while we think about fighting and flying, uh, Pimax reps reached out and reminded me that November is dogfighting month in DCS, and they're working with a couple of DCS stalwarts to help celebrate that. Now, I'll post a link to the website so you can check out for yourself what all this means. And also, if you're interested in picking up a Pimax product, you can use my discount code at the Pimax store to save yourself a little bit of money if you're eager to get your hands on Pimax products, which I recommend you do because once you try DCS in VR, you won't be able to go back and BFM becomes a whole new game, really, a lot more enjoyable with VR. In fact, you'll find yourself really having to crank your neck around uh, to... See behind you if you've got yourself in a spot of bother. So I thoroughly recommend it. If it's in your budget, definitely the Crystal Light, being a little lighter on the budget and the best bang for your buck in their excellent products, which are so good for DCS World. And that, gentle people, brings us to the end of another DCS Sip Rip. I want to thank you all for the support recently, especially the likes and the comments, the candor on the DCS ecosystem, which is in a state of flux and certainly a state of ongoing controversy. We have to wait for some resolutions to occur here with regards to RASBAM, and we're waiting for an announcement from the RASBAM team about the direction that they're taking. Uh, whether that involves something to do with Eagle Dynamics, we'll have to wait and see, fingers crossed. Um, we're almost at 12,000 subscribers here, so it pushes this little channel over that mark, so don't forget to subscribe. It helps the channel chug along. It's very useful for us in uh, you know challenging these uh, very, very uh, competitive YouTube algorithms. Now we're close to the end of the year too. It's just a couple more months for ED to perhaps surprise us with some more great updates like this one with regards to the Syria. I think there'll be competition from Microsoft Flight Simulator 2024 over the next couple of weeks. Certainly that initial excitement when uh, everyone's going to go and have a gander at it, uh, it's going to drag some players away just to at least have a look. Then maybe after a couple of weeks or so, we'll get bored and then come back to DCS World, the premier combat flight simulator for the home PC, if I haven't mentioned it before. All right, thanks again. This is Prickly Hedgehog out. Stay safe, everybody. We'll see you next time on the DCS Sit Rep. See you. Showtime, fleet 5-4, standby pod number. Showtime, fleet 5-4, pod number 1878. Fleet 5-4, showtime, copy 1878. That's what we show. Recycle pod, please. Showtime, fleet 5-4, welcome. Pablo 220. Pablo 220 at 20, 21,000. Sadly, we did not turn the set. Pablo 220. Check in, 
Call when you're, uh, when you're your you're ready. Real time now, 30,000 feet away from the uh, Bamas. Uh, 